Org website, a powerful resource that tracks how much money donors give to federal and state campaigns. My name is Manuela Ikawo, and I'm a media associate on the Democracy Collaborative at Rethink Media. I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar. Rethink Media is a national nonprofit focused on building the communications capacity of nonprofit groups working to strengthen our nation's national security, civil and human rights, and democracy. We're very excited that the National Institute on Money and Politics has offered to share a rundown of their website, um, resources that are available, as well as answer questions you all have today. I'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves in a minute, but the National Institute on Money and Politics, as a little, a little bit of background, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that promotes an accountable democracy by compiling comprehensive campaign donor, lobbyist, and other information from government disclosure agencies nationwide and makes it freely available on followthemoney.org. So how are we going to spend the next hour? What's in store for you? I'll quickly go over some housekeeping items and then uh, that will be quickly uh, followed by some introductions by our speakers and facilitators for today's training. After our introductions, we will have a, a presentation and, and demonstration from our friends at Follow the Money. And after their presentation, we'll leave about 15 or so minutes for Q&A before we quickly wrap up um, and share information about how to follow up with us after um, the webinar. So for the purpose of today's webinar, all participants have been placed on mute. If you have a question for one of our trainers during the presentation, use the questions icon located at the bottom of your screen. We will address those questions during our Q&A portion. If you happen to already have a question right now that's relevant to the work you're doing, go ahead and ask them now and we'll make sure that we address those questions later on in the Q&A. If you have a technical question at any point, for example, you can't hear the presentation or you can't see the presentation, use the chat icon also located at the bottom of your screen and send a message to admin rethink media and we will do our best um, to help you get reconnected. At the end of the webinar, a quick evaluation will pop up on your screen um, asking how you thought today's webinar went. We'd really appreciate it if you filled it out with your feedback to help us improve on future webinars. So with that out of the way, let's move on to uh, introducing today's speakers. Once again, I'm Manuela Ikoo. I'm a media associate with Rethink Media, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar. I'll quickly pass it over to Spencer, my colleague Spencer Everything, to introduce himself before allowing our, our, our trainers at Follow the Money to introduce themselves. Uh, hi everyone, this is Spencer Olson. I'm our Associate Director at Rethink Media of our Democracy Collaborative, and I will be behind the scenes today uh, helping run the tech. Um, so any questions you have, please do put those in the chat or Q&A and I will help you resolve them. Thanks, Spencer. Um, and now over to our trainers um, at Follow the Money, Denise and Pete. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we appreciate your interest and we're going to show you a lot of uh, things on our website that are amazing tools, amazing data. And we don't expect you to remember everything, but we do hope that you will just contact us the next time you get on our site and want to glean information from it. So uh, Manuel already introduced us, so I'm going to stick to right now before we get into um, how to tool around. I want to first talk about how come we're not scrolling down the data that we do have on the website. So we have under for state election that means elections to state office from everywhere from the legislature up to the governor. We have that in all 50 states from 2000 on, as you can see here. And we also have the contributions raised by the main political parties and the ballot measure campaigns. And you can see the dates when we began gathering that data. We have independent spending data in 28 states. Pete's gonna walk you through that. 
We began also adding federal election data from 2010 on. And we also have lobbyist data, uh, who registered in the states to register who is lobbying at the state level from 2006 on. And uh, local races in just a few places. We'd love to do more, but we're, we don't have the ability to do that. So it's important to kind of know what, we, what data we have and thereby what we don't have for your analysis. Um, let me go up here. So what we do, as you've heard, is we gather all of the campaign finance reports and the lobbying expenditure reports and we put it up on our, our database. It's not raw data. We do add value to the data by um, assigning economic industry codes to the donors where we can, so that you can do an analysis of you know, oil and gas donors, industry donors, um, and the coding system that we use is very similar to the coding system by Open Secrets, if you're familiar with that. And it's a good idea to just kind of play around we have these broad economic sectors. And then within oil and gas, for example, um, we have different businesses. So you can make your query by sector very broad or very narrow. Uh, the other value we add to the data is we try as hard as we can anyway to standardize the donor names because in the raw data, you'd be kind of surprised how many ways you can say AT&T. Um, so we standardize those donor names and that is what separates our data from the, the data you can see at the individual state agencies. Government agencies don't assign economic codes and they don't standardize the name. So it's good data, but it's raw and therefore hard to work with. We also, um, in, in addition to providing data for people to work with on their own, we do do our own analysis. We have various reports and blogs that we publish periodically. We also have, of course, our, our uh, uh, Facebook page and our, our Twitter, page, Twitter feed. So if you're not on that, we encourage you to join. And one more thing before I pass it on to Pete to really dig in. If you haven't done so already, please register to create a My Follow the Money account. And as advocates and journalists and academics, we do actually provide expanded access to the data by download. So, um, but you first have to create an account and then let us know you want expanded access. So I'm going to now hand it over to Pete Quist, our research director. Hello everybody. I'm about to show you how to dive into some of the data on our website. Um, before I really get going here, uh, many of you will be tempted to um, tool around on our website while we're doing this presentation to see what you can see. Um, I want to open by saying that our website is very dynamic and is generating results to, for queries as you run them. Um, if we get a lot of people doing that all at once, it can slow it down. So um, we're going to try to do some of this live. So if you can refrain from tooling around on the website until after this presentation, that will help us out. From our homepage at followthemoney.org, um, the first thing that I'm going to highlight here is our brand new state at a glance tool. Uh, we are known very much for providing huge volumes of, of data that can be searched in multiple different ways, which we're going to get into in a minute. But this is one of our uh, first efforts with this website to create package data. So you can see just real quickly uh, what a state looks like. For this example, we're gonna go and look at Illinois. And so if I click on Illinois here, this takes a few seconds to load, so I've brought it up already. Then we can see our Illinois State at a Glance page. And I'm going to go over a few of the items that are here. Um, this is really exciting for us. I'm, I'm really pumped to be talking about this. Um, right away, you see that we're looking at elections in 2017 and 2018, and there's some information about trends in the state. Uh, here we see that the um, campaigns involve very high dollars per vote, so they're very expensive campaigns, and they're not monetarily competitive. And this is dynamic to the, to the state that we've selected. And, by not monetarily competitive, what we mean here is that if you're running uh, for a single seat office, such as uh, a governor office or a, a state house office, for example, in, in Illinois, uh, that the candidate raising the most money is raising more than twice as much as the next candidate. And we just, we determine that to be non-competitive. It's a pretty generous definition of competitive. So 
uh, in Illinois, you really have people running away with, with elections as far as the fundraising goes. Um, both of these things, incidentally, um, tend to favor incumbents running in elections. We can see a breakdown of the offices that are up for election and how many um, candidates are running, how much money has been raised by office, and disclosure scores. Uh, we've looked at contributions disclosure and independent spending disclosure. And these will actually link directly to reports that we've written about um, what the disclosure looks like in that state. So for the disclosure scores for contributions, for example, do you get to see donors' employment information? So where do they work? Um, which helps a lot with categorizing what kind of economic interests uh, they represent um, and how often do they report and that sort of thing. And the independent spending disclosure is very good in Illinois. This is things like our express advocacy ads disclosed, our electioneering communications disclosed. We get a breakdown of data availability within the state. And then this is a really exciting piece of it. This is uh, dynamic graphs looking at uh, fundraising patterns. So right now we're looking at contributions to state campaigns in Illinois, uh, including uh, candidates and party committees and ballot measure committees. Um, you can see a breakdown of what's included here. These graphs are showing that a lot of candidate contributions have come in. It really dominated the elections in Illinois in 2017 and 2018. For those of you who might be familiar with the gubernatorial race in 2018, um, Bruce Rauner and J.B. Pritzker faced off against each other in a self-funding titanic battle uh, where <laughs> they were just pouring money into their own campaigns. It was something interesting to see. Um, we can see then that this plays out in the uh, contributions from individuals over $1,000. That makes up a pretty high percentage of the money that was raised in Illinois in this election cycle. And then you can break it down by statewide offices. So here we're seeing the gubernatorial race really standing out in those self-funding totals and, and the contributions from individuals over $1,000. This includes the candidates making contributions to their own campaign. And then we see the breakdown change a little bit for legislative races where party committees and labor have dominated the contributions there uh, during these two election years. And we see non-individual, non-party contributions coming in. These are contributions from PACs or in the states that permit them uh, from corporations and unions directly. And then the non-individual party, these are the party committees. And then we break down the individuals by their dollar amount, as always. And so you can really get a feel for what's happening in the different kinds of elections in a state. As we scroll down further, we get some analysis of the candidates running in the state. In legislative races, because we've selected legislative in the tab above, we can see that incumbents are raising two thirds of the money. This is really what we tend to see for expensive races that are not competitive. Incumbents do tend to raise a lot and they tend to win. Democrats have dominated the fundraising in Illinois and males have dominated the fundraising in Illinois, male candidates. This is a new feature that we've added this year, um, assigning the uh, gender identification to, uh, to the candidates for state races. If we actually uh, change the selection up here, we see that it moves. Or now we have a challenger raising a lot of money in the gubernatorial race because J.B. Pritzker actually outspent Bruce Rauner in that race. We can see top donors uh, from individuals and non-individuals to get a feel for who the power players are. And then we have advanced metrics down here where we can look at the dollars per vote. This, this does, um, reflects the offices that you choose to select or deselect. We can see the competitiveness compared to nationwide for votes and money. And we can see breakdown of office holders by political alignment based on their donor uh, information. So these are donors that give primarily to Republicans. We'll push that office holder towards Republicans and to Democrats to Democrats. Next thing I want to show you is our entity page. Denise talked briefly about the idea that uh, we standardize uh, donor names. And when we do that, we assign an ID number to that donor. And then we aggregate all the information that we have about that person or group so that you can see it all in one place. I'm going to run a search here. For Anna Caballero.
And when I do that, I'll get a list of search results. It will include other Anna Cam Caballeros. Uh, there will be multiple ones in the system. And if I click on candidates here, I can see uh, Deanna Caballero that is a candidate, and then I can click on her name. I've preloaded this page already. When I click on her name, it brings you to our entity page. This is basically everything that we know about this person. You can see that we have information about her as a contributor, as a candidate, as a sitting office holder, and the filers that are associated with her. And you have tabs along the side here. So under, as a contributor, we can see in an overview that she's given about $5,000 to five different recipients. A lot of that actually went to herself. You can take a look at the money that she's given to party committees and ballot measure committees and so forth. Um, you can take a look at the overall trends of her contributions. So the political party affiliation of the recipient, um, whether the candidates have won or lost. 3,500 of this was to herself and she's a winner. So that's why that's so large. And the incumbency status. We also allow you to look at donors who have a similar donation profile. Now she hasn't given to a lot of different people. Um, so this is going to show some people that are extremely high with very small data points. But I just want to highlight that this exists. Sometimes with large donors, you can see some pretty interesting um, trends. Similarly, as a candidate, we can see similar candidates. And so Tim Grayson has a donor profile that looks, uh, or a profile of donors that looks very similar uh, to Anna Caballero's. And if you click a side by side, you can actually get a side by side comparison of what that looks like. And what this basically means is that many of the donors are shared. So donors making contributions to both of these individuals and in similar amounts. So if you know you have a friend in the legislature, for example, on a, on a policy that you're working on and that they have some donors that might be able to speak to, to your policy um, and, and get access to those legislators, you can look for other legislators perhaps that have uh, similar donors. And so you can try to build out that network. You know, this candidate has raised $9 million in various elections. We also show information about Anna Caballero as an office holder, including which offices she's held each year and her legislative committee assignments. Filers that she has associated with her. So these are her fundraising committees. And then because we collect independent spending data in Illinois, uh, we can actually see the independent expenditures that are targeting her. So she, she's been spent on by $5 million. And you can get a list of the top spenders targeting her. Some of these might be supporting her campaign. And then the elections with the totals there. And we'll get a little bit more into the independent spending data shortly and have a look at how you can tell whether these independent expenditures are made to support or oppose a candidate and run advanced searches on them. First, Denise is going to show you how to get into more detail on the campaign contributions. Okay. So one of our predominant features is our Ask Anything, which enables you to basically ask anything. And I'm gonna run a query um, because I'm interested in knowing um, how much gambling money was given to candidates in Illinois and Wisconsin in 2018. So I'm gonna do ask anything. I have this already preloaded, but um, I'm gonna try and run it. And if it runs quickly, then um, we're gonna go live. So the first thing I do is I click on contributions to, and I want 2018, so I'm gonna grab the 2018 year. This is where people kind of get tripped up. They don't know that you could kind of keep going back and narrowing down your search. So I'm going to hit contributions to again because I want to select Illinois and Wisconsin. Illinois here and then Wisconsin below. And um, the other place that people get stuck is um, wait, before I do this, I just want to know, so sometimes people will click this and then that ends up selecting everything. So don't click the main box if you don't want all states. 
So that's another place people get tripped up a lot. And then they don't understand why they can't select certain states. So, and now we're back here. Now, if you recall, I wanted only gambling donors, not all of the donors. So that's where I do now go to contributions from. And as you can see, we're not going to get into every one of these, but these are all various buttons that you could push to, um, to select various things. And it's a lot of fun to do this. So we encourage you on your own to explore, but sticking with the script, we're going to go with the industry. And you're going to see the tree similar to, or the, the hierarchy, similar to what you saw before. But let's say you don't know where gambling exists within this hierarchy. So you can search by name. Um, so And I'm going to hit go. Oh, sorry. I'm going to hit go. Never mind. Uh, now I'm going to hit go. <laughs> so the very first thing you get is simply the answer to your question. And this is another place where people get stuck. So this is where it's important to show you the, our data navigator because the program doesn't quite know what it is you want to see. So you have to tell it. And so that's where the data nav navigator comes in. And probably one of my favorite features is all these various tabs because I have a lot of different questions to ask of this one data set and I don't want to lose my, the various views. So let's say I wanted to map this out, for example. Obviously it's only two states, but let's say I have collected or selected a lot of different states, you can map it out. But I don't want to lose this visual, so I'm going to open up another tab. And you'll notice when I do, for those who pay attention to URLs, is every time you select something different, um, more information gets added to the, more tokens get added to the URL. So this is a very dynamic URL. You can copy and paste it to yourself or to somebody else. Um, and so I wanted to know by year. And now I say, well, I want to know how much these, who are these, who are these donors? So I'm going to click on the contributor. And these are, it always sorts by total down, but you could sort by any heading throughout. And if you wanted to know about the 173 records that totaled these 230,000, like if you wanted to know, I really want to know who Arlington Park Racehorse gave to, like they're the only ones I'm interested in. Don't click on their entity name because then you're going to get everything we have. You could actually click on this magnifying glass and you'll note it opens up a new window. So if you hit, if you try and go back, you can't go back because you're in a new window. So instead, you just go back to your original query. So that's the value of the magnifying glass. So now you see the contributor. Um, and now you have another question, which is, you know, who did these uh, donors give to by incumbency? For example, when you get this box, it means you're only going to see the money given to candidates, not to the party and ballot measure committees. So if you've got this 1.5 million number locked in your head, you'll, and then you run the query, you're going to see this doesn't total, my query doesn't total 1.5, and that's because you only selected for candidates. And then let's, you obviously can select more than one box at a time. So if you could want to just see, for example, incumbency. So the ones, this program sorts, as I mentioned, by highest dollar down. So as you can see, and to no one's surprise, the incumbent winners receive the most money. So as you can see, again, if you've logged in, which I didn't do, um, but if you've logged in, you could actually save your query here. You could give it a certain name, um, or you could sometimes it's just easier to copy and paste it and send it to yourself. Um, I'm going to go back now. So that's just an example of how to run various, um, how to get lots of different information out of this one query. And you want to always be paying attention to what your query 
was so that as you run down various rabbit holes, you can sort of lose track of where you were. Um, but I want to go back to just a main ask anything because I have a few more minutes um, and just talk about the different options you see in this box. Um, if I actually want to look at independent spending data, which I won't do because Pete's going to uh, tour you, give you a tour of that in a little bit, but you could select here for independent or lobbying data, but it defaults to contributions data. This here is if you are uh, only wanting to look at federal races, you would deselect state and local or vice versa if you only wanted state and local or just one or the other, but that's how you can narrow down the jurisdiction of the data you're looking for. The contributions from, you could actually do it by location. So city, state, or zip. And we're not gonna go into it entirely, but um, I just wanna show you your various options that you could do so on your own. The types of contributors, you know, non-individuals versus individuals. Sometimes if you wanna do, for example, you know, an industry search, but you don't want, you actually want to exclude the individuals who are employed by that company because you don't necessarily know that that's why they're giving. So you want it to be a much cleaner analysis. You could select for non-individuals only, which by the way, you could also do here when you click on type of contributor. A lot of different ways to do the same thing. Parent organization types of records. Um, you could specify certain amounts if you want within certain dates or again by industry. The type of contributor here again, um, if you are really wanting to do an analysis of who these donors are, you'll see that the majority of the donors gave uh, were non individuals. So they were actually the companies or the PACs. Um, one thing I didn't show, which I'm going to do now is if you want to see if they gave to ballot measure committees, again, you get that box saying, if you see this, you're only going to see ballot measures. So you say, okay. And they didn't give any to ballot measures. Maybe there weren't any, whatever. And then if you want to see what they gave to, to the party committees, you can show that. And you can see these are the party committees that receive money from the gambling industry. So we're really trying to illustrate, um, you know, all the various questions that you can ask of the ask anything. And before I hand it back to Pete, I do also want to make sure we do have these tutorials here that we designed. They're one to two minute long, maybe three to four occasional ones. But they're, if you want to say, how do I, how do I do a very, how do I make a very specific query? Then you can go there and just spend a minute looking there. And you're also just more than welcome as always to send us an email or, or give us a call and say, this is what I'm looking for. How do I do that? Okay, so back to Pete. Cool, so a lot there. And as you can see, our database, our website is very much designed to allow you to ask any question and to provide you uh, the answer as long as it's within the parameters of our database. Um, so you can ask, Pretty much anything. If I want to see gambling interest to Democratic incumbents in State Senate District 23 in Texas, I can do that. So, um, and it's worth pointing out that um, I don't think people that are unfamiliar with the site will come away from this um, tutorial um, really being able to run advanced searches on their own. But what we're trying to do is, is make sure that you're aware that this information exists and has been aggregated for you and is uh, searchable for you. So you can reach out to us at any time and we can help you with this. As Denise pointed out on the Ask Anything search, we can change the criteria from contributions data to independent spending data. And the interface will look somewhat similar. Uh, the options will change slightly to reflect the data set that you're looking at. We can look at uh, contributions to, I'm going to, in this case, uh, revisit Illinois just because I really fell in love with their elections in 2018 because of how um, abnormal they were. Uh, but I'm going to look at contribution or independent spending targeting races in Illinois. So targeting, and I have lots of different options here. And I wanna take just a moment to point out a couple of them. You can look at independent spending targeting a specific race 
or a kind of an office such as state senate, uh, for example, um, or candidates that won versus candidates that lost. We're going to do a pretty simple one here and just look at independent spending targeting specific states. But keep those options in mind in just a minute here as I point out our displays. So again, as Denise mentioned, anytime you see a little black arrow, you can click on it to expand the list. I'm clicking on Illinois. And just as with the previous interface with contributions, we're building a sentence in the middle here. Show me independent spending in Illinois. And actually, I'm going to uh, just leave that the way it is and look across years. So I'm just clicking on go. We do categorize independent spenders by their economic interest where we can. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time highlighting that in this case. Uh, it's the same classifications as we have for contributors. But independent spenders tend to be pretty hard to identify, so we end up with a lot of unidentified ones. But we can take a look at how much independent spending total happens in Illinois. And we can see $63 million here in the years that we have. But which years are they? With these boxes here, we can actually select by filing year. This is the year in which the independent expenditures were made. And we can see that these are the total amounts for each of these years. Uh, I pointed out a couple of possible criteria on the search, and I want to, to <coughs> illustrate the relationship between the search and the display. Uh, each of these boxes that you see on the display options, and this was true of the contribution search too, uh, are also things that you can select on your search. So when I was talking about uh, the idea that you can look at spending targeting a specific race, uh, we can do that by clicking on political race. This box is aggregating data by the field that we could have also filtered by. So we can get a breakdown that the 2014 gubernatorial race actually featured the most in this data set. We can also display by candidate and by position. And this would show us a row of data that says J.B. Pritzker was targeted by $14 million in spending supporting his campaign or opposing his campaign and so forth. So these are all really fun to play with. Um, you can also do the industry and sector of the, of the spender. Um, these reflect the same three-tier classification system that Denise talked about with campaign contributions. Um, but again, these are a little bit harder to identify. Independent expenditures are where we talk about the dark money issue, and that's how that sort of plays out in our database, uh, in that it becomes pretty difficult for us sometimes to see uh, exactly who those spenders represent. Um, the last thing that I'll point out on this page is that there is a data export option. Uh, anytime you run an Ask Anything search on this website, whether it's for contributions or independent expenditures or lobbying, which Denise is going to talk about in just a moment, um, you will see a button here that says data export. And if you are signed into an account on our website, you can actually click that or drop all the way down to the bottom of the page on your own and see these data export options for CSV and Excel. So you can actually download the table that you have generated it will reflect exactly the display options you have here. So if I exported this, this is what I would get. You can also stream the data from our website to your website through XML or JSON API languages. So I just want to point that out too. Um, this is a free service for journalists and scholars and, and uh, advocacy organizations. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Denise, to talk about lobbying. <laughs> So another way to get to a specific data set, and it's one I use frequently because I can't remember the states for which we've collected independent spending data for or lobbying because we don't have it in all 50 states for each one because of the poor disclosure in those states. So one way rather than the, um, if you're wanting to know whether or not we have lobbying expenditures or independent spending in a specific state, you could just click on here. And it will show you all of the lobbying expenditure data that we have. And you'll see quickly that we have it for 20 states. 
that we have lobbying expenditure data in 20 states. The reason that we don't have it in all 50 is in the other 30 states, sadly, um, the states do not require the disclosure of the compensation paid to lobbyists, which is in fact the lion's share of the money spent on lobbying. So we don't want to collect a data set that is so woefully uh, incomplete because then if, for example, we collected it from one of those states and we documented a million dollars was spent, that would look like that's how much truly was spent when in fact it might have been 10 million if you included the compensation, which wasn't disclosed. So rather than having complete data, we just aren't getting that data. And we hope that people will uh, lobby for stronger lobbying disclosure laws in their state so we can get a true picture of the money spent. Um, we primarily have data in these 20 states from 20 and 2012 on. However, in a few states, California, for example, they gave us earlier data that we didn't want to get rid of. So if you actually wanted to look at these 20 states together, a truer search would be just looking from 2012 on. Because at this point, you see California as the highest. It may be, but it could also be because it has other years that Alaska, for example, doesn't have. So in this case, I'm just going to go to state year. And I'm just going to select from 2012 on. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm just going to tell you, you can. But for purposes of this discussion, to be quick, I'm just going to look at 2018. Sorry about that. Um, because I don't want to take too long uh, with the query. And what you may have noticed earlier is just the phenomenal amount of money. If, if you were impressed already, hopefully you were with the amount of money spent or given in direct contributions to candidates. It pales in comparison to the money spent lobbying. And look at that, that's 1.6 billion in 2018 alone, and that's only 20 states. So it's kind of amazing how much money is spent lobbying. I'm going to open up another tab because the first question I would ask is, well, who's, who is doing all that spending? Who are the biggest ones? And you're going to see Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, if you hover over their name, you can see a little more about them, but that they were also big donors. And this is why we call them entities. We don't call them donors because in this case, PG&E is both a donor and a spender. So they're just an entity in our system. They might be, they might play various roles. So that's why we refer to these um, entities as, as such. Um, if you wanted to look at their, again, if you wanted to look at their specific spending, I'm going to go to PG&E. California has really good disclosure, so you can get a lot out of their information. And you can see, well, who are they targeting? Well, no, you can't see who they're targeting because that's not quite there, but you could see um, what, how, how are they spending the money? And again, you could see compensation normally is the largest, except there's a loophole in California's disclosure law that allows um, spenders to just throw everything into the other category. Um, but aside from that, this would have been interesting. Uh, if we've coded it, we try hard to code the spending data, but we know that it's, um, well, we know PG&E is energy and natural resources. Oh, I'm on PG&E. That's why that was there. Sorry. So I'm going to go back to, no, I'm not. Oh, I can go back this way. Sorry. Um, well, I guess I could just show, I think we're done. <laughs> I'm done with spending, but we just really encourage you to play, to ex examine this lobbying expenditure data because it's just a wealth of information. Okay. And now Pete is going to talk about our, my legislature tool. Right. So we've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time here going over the data that we collect, um, 
and, and there's a lot of it there. Uh, for example, for uh, state candidates every two years, we're collecting 200,000 campaign finance reports, many of which are handwritten and things like that, that we uh, key in and have very robust quality control measures to ensure that it's uh, uh, high enough quality to be peer reviewable for academic research. Uh, and uh, this is uh, raises the question, what does it all mean? And so we're trying to answer that question in a couple of ways here. From our homepage, uh, under the tools section, you can actually scroll down to a tool that is called the My Legislature tool. And this is right at paulomar.org. If you just scroll down past the map, you'll get to the tools. And here's My Legislature. And I'm just going to pick on Alabama because it's first in the list. And so, oops, go ahead and submit. And so the point here is that we have a list of all the legislators in Alabama. We actually have the other office holders too. And although we won't have time today, uh, you can do searches for contributions just to sitting office holders, for example, uh, and, and do analysis of that. Um, but for this tool, we're looking at lawmakers, including lists of legislative leaders and who the top contributors to the lawmakers are. And we have a legislative bill feed that shows every bill introduced in every legislative session in every state and in Congress. Uh, that we get through an API feed from LegisScan through a data sharing agreement. And if we were to click on a bill, we can get information about what has happened to that bill. So an overview of the bill, who the sponsors are, top donors to the sponsors, and events of the bill. And the, the key thing here is that uh, we can see uh, which committees the bill was referred to. So here we see it was sent to the Senate Committee on Transportation and Energy. So we can go to this Committees tab, scroll down past these House Committees, and reach the Senate Committee on Transportation and Energy. What this is going to do is give us a list of the members and the opportunity to uh, look at contributions to the members. There are industry analyses that can be done here. Uh, we can look at whether members of this committee receive more from a given industry uh, than members of the chamber as a whole, for example. And these are things that I just want you to be aware exist so you can reach out to us uh, for your own analysis in the future. And we can dive into the data in more detail. And this will take you to an interface that looks very familiar in which you can look at contributions to members of this legislative committee and break it down in the ways that we've been talking about today. Um, so this is us trying to take this data and make it live in the world of policymaking and in the idea that this can be used then to, to feed um, issue advocacy. Um, in that realm, I'll mention that we have a new tool that we are working on uh, that we plan to launch here this fall. That is a power mapping tool that will allow you to do um, power mapping based on your issue and who's supporting and opposing it and what kinds of contributions they've made to the recipients that you care about, the state senators or state representatives or governor or members of a legislative committee and so forth, and lay out the likelihood based on the donor information at least about uh, who would be likely to support or oppose your bill. And hopefully uh, we can illustrate some relationships that might be possible to make uh, that wouldn't be evident through other approaches. And so that might be a good supplement to your power mapping work. So we are at 45 minutes in. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it back to Manuela to do a Q&A. Great, thank you. Spencer, did you want to jump in now? Yes, uh, thank you, Denise and Pete. Uh, so we have a few questions from uh, folks on the webinar. And uh, as I dive into the questions that we received so far, if there's any questions that you have, please uh, type those in in the Q&A box or the uh, chat box, and I'll make sure I raise those right now. Um, so Denise and Pete, I'll just run through these starting at the top here. Uh, first question is, how often do you update state election data? If you can kind of give a little more context on how quick that turnaround is from an election to getting this uploaded into the data set and uh, what states might be more challenging and what uh, states are a little bit easier to get the data um, added. Yes, absolutely. So collecting state data is a complex task. 
Um, our, our federal data is usually up now within a couple of days of the quarterly reports being filed. Um, our state data takes a little bit longer. We're, every state is a puzzle between what might be available through an electronic download and what isn't and what might be handwritten on PDFs that we have to then key into our system and then ensure the accuracy is, is very high. Uh, and in a couple of states, we even get reports shipped to us in the US mail. Uh, and so these things can cause delays in getting this data up, but we make a list of every campaign finance report that every candidate's party committee and ballot measure committee could conceivably have to file during the course of an election. And as those report deadlines pass, uh, we review them to see if they are available and then collect them as quickly as we can uh, based on those formats uh, and our, our limited staff size. So ideally uh, what we have is campaign finance reports from a state uh, where good electronic data is available and complete uh, coming up onto our website within a couple of days. Um, but in some cases it can take much longer if we're waiting on reports to be mailed to us and then having to send them out for input. So the short answer really is that we're um, uploading data every day. Um, the, the answer for any given report can be pretty complex. And I'll, I'll add too that there, you know, if, if you follow federal campaigns, then you become accustomed to being able to know at any given moment exactly where the data collection is because all of the file, filers have to play by the same rules. Um, they have the same uh, d deadlines, et cetera. And so it's very easy to assess what's going on at the federal level at any given moment. It's very impossible to do the same at, in all 50 states at any one time due to the various disclosure deadlines, reports, and um, as Pete just mentioned, all of the various um, things that affect how quickly we can get the reports from the state. So you just can't expect um, getting all of that information, you know, on the spot. There's no such thing, absolutely no such thing as real time disclosure at the state level. Great. So I have one other question so far around uh, the data sets. Is there a way to know uh, when the database was last updated? And I think this is a question that was raised when you were going through some of the examples. Is there like a timestamp somewhere that's visualized or any way that can mark the, the date for folks? Yeah, so uh, what we're going to do here is take a look at this uh, query that we've run from the gambling and casino um, piece. So if we look at uh, this query, uh, which is one that we just ran live on the website, there's a bar here that shows how complete we are with the data for that specific query. And this reflects the query that you make on the website. It tells you how far along we are and if we have any campaign finance reports yet to collect. This 9434 represents all of the reports that we think these candidates or recipients could conceivably have had to file over the course of the elections that are in your query. And so if we look at that, then we know that we're 100% complete here or 90% complete or so forth. Uh, if we look at the record level data, which is this website's language for transaction level data, then one of the fields in it will be last updated. And what this means is that the record, uh, th this will be the timestamp for the last time we made a significant change to a record. Usually that means that the record was added that day. Uh, in some cases, it may mean that we've standardized and categorized the contributor that day. Um, but this is our closest uh, thing to a record level timestamp. Uh, publicly on the site. I think in the end, if you're looking at our data during an election and you really want to use it, but you want to understand how complete or incomplete it is and when will it be next updated, when was it last updated, you should just give us a call or send us an email and we'll give you uh, an update. On, we'll, we'll let you know where we are with that particular state. Yep. Um, we are always available to reach out to. That's um, it's really nice for us to get our heads out of spreadsheets and, and onto the phones. Great. And uh, that was also one of our questions is how best to contact uh, the presenters. And we'll show on the screen as we wrap up in a few minutes here, everyone's contact email address. And we'll also be sure to follow up with participants today with additional resources and everyone's contact information as well. So you'll receive that in an email. Uh, so well, um, 
Go ahead. I should also mention that our phone number is on the bottom of every page of our website. Uh, and we actually do answer the phone and Denise and I are more likely to answer the phone than anyone. So if you just call our main line, then you will get a hold of us. Great. So I have uh, two other uh, data questions. One is, do you link anywhere on the website to primary source documents? And the second one is GIS or shapefile data also available? Uh, so I'll take those in order. Uh, first, uh, on the menu in the upper left corner of our site, um, we do link to the agencies that uh, provide the data. Uh, we don't link directly to the source documents themselves, largely because many states do not make that possible. Um, uh, in many cases, you cannot link directly to a report. They use uh, various search technology that doesn't create unique links to, to reports or, or that sort of thing. Um, but we can uh, include information about uh, which campaign finance report data came from. If you give us a call, we can talk that over with you if you're concerned about anything or have just questions about where it came from and we can help you locate that original um, document or, or data search. Yeah, I think the, the key point there is there's absolutely no correlation between state and federal data. So I know at the FEC level, you can easily get the primary source, but that's because it's from one location and one possible process, whereas at the 50 state level, even in a state, for example, like Illinois, that has really good electronic digitized data, uh, we still have to massage it quite a bit to get it to where we want it to be. We have to, there's a lot of states with electronic files that are missing pieces of the data. So even if we did provide a link, it wouldn't match with what we have because we went in and found the missing. I don't ask why, but in many, too many states, there's uh, things such as loans and loan repayments and unitemized that are not in the electronic data that we have to supplement. So you kind of have to give up the ghost on getting primary source data unless you go directly to the state for it. The last thing I'll mention on that piece is that uh, in many cases, particularly in some of the older years, uh, the primary source data no longer exists. So we have the only record of state campaign contributions in many states in the mid 2000s, for example. Um, in a lot of cases, those were all filed on paper and agencies just run out of space to store it, so they throw it away. And so we're, we're it. <laughs> um, and I forgot the second part of that and, question. Yeah, the second question was, uh, are there GIS or shapefile data available? Yes, we are geocoding contributions um, and we hope to come out with a couple of products uh, related to that soon. Um, but if you're interested in, in more information about that, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Great, and then I have two uh, remaining questions here. The first one is, um, is the data of dollars raised by state races by incumbency, uh, which I believe was a chart you all showed earlier on in the presentation, is that the average per race or of all races? Uh, so the website will not do averages for you. This is um, reflecting the total dollar amount for whatever query you have run. So if you're looking at uh, contributions to uh, Republican state Senate candidates in Texas uh, and who are incumbents, then it will show you the total dollar amount raised by that data set. You can break it down in different ways as we uh, illustrated very briefly, um, such as by the amount raised by each candidate, uh, by displaying by candidate or by political race to see which, uh, how much money was raised within each of the races in your criteria and so forth. Um, to do more advanced metrics such as averages, uh, the website uh, doesn't work well for that because of the dynamicism of the searches, but if you download that through one of those data export options we mentioned, uh, then you can work with it in a spreadsheet or in R or something like that. Excellent. Uh, so the last question I have right now is, um, is there a way to see the average amount spent on candidate campaigns and or ballot measure campaigns in a state? In other words, how much was spent on ballot measure campaigns in Missouri in 2018? And yeah, so that's absolutely a search that you can run on this website, um, doing an Ask Anything search, looking for contributions to, uh, and then for ballot measure campaigns uh, in the state of Missouri. Um, that would be a, a pretty straightforward search to do. And you can actually run that search across the country um, and across as many years as you'd like to. So this uh, will really allow you to create whatever data parameter you would like. Um, 
And for a specific search like that, uh, we're always available. Um, I can't emphasize this enough, and I, I sound like a broker and record every time I present, um, but we are always available to reach out to. If you have a specific search that you need a hand with, uh, we can help you with it over the phone. And as you can see on the screen here, I have Illinois pulled up, but because Illinois doesn't do ballot measures, um, or at least they didn't in 2018, I don't think they do in general, but if they did, the ballot measures would be here. So you would be able to then click on the ballot measure committees and determine how much, you know, the, the you, with just a little bit of math, you could figure out how much they was raised by ballot measures as a percentage of the money raised overall. And the other thing we forgot to um, show you earlier is this is 2017 and 2018 elections combined, but if you want to see the year split out, you just would click on one of these two. Okay, and a quick follow-up to that question is, do you also track contributions to opposing specific ballot measure, measure campaigns in states? Oh, yeah. Right, so any uh, committee that forms to support or oppose a ballot measure, um, we will collect the contributions to that committee. Um, and uh, we also, uh, I'll mention, uh, categorize ballot measures by subject. So if you're working on a, a measure in, in your state, uh, it's very likely not the first time that measure has come up in the country. Uh, these measures tend to be uh, sort of national a lot of the time. And uh, we can show you what a similar measure in other states uh, has looked like from a donor profile and who's likely to come in and play. I just pulled up the Missouri. Um, you can see all, it's basically what this is showing is all the committees that raised money around the measure, whether it was in support of or in opposition to the measures. Um, this is a complex data set in that in many states, a committee will support one measure and oppose another or support five different measures and oppose three or something like that. So um, there are ways to get to more detailed data for the committees with their positions on, on different measures. Um, but for a broad analysis like that, that would be another example of a, a way to something to get in touch with us about. Great. Thank you, Pete and Denise. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Manuela. Thank you um, uh, for that great demonstration and for those thoughtful questions. Um, if we, if you have other questions that come up later, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, our email addresses are listed now on the screen. Um, our phone numbers are also available um, as well. Um, everyone will receive a recording of today's webinar. Uh, we'll also make sure that you receive handy links and uh, more tools to further explore uh, Follow the Money's uh, website, um, as well as have uh, quick access to our con all of our contact information. As a reminder, a quick survey will pop up on your screen asking how you thought today's webinar uh, went. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you filled it out with your feedback. And those of you who complete the evaluation will be first in line to receive some of that follow-up training materials. Thank you all again, Denise, Pete, Spencer, and, and to our participants for joining us today. Um, this concludes uh, our webinar.